So I'm going to talk about testing Spark 2 and higher. Um, I'm really curious, who uses Spark in the audience? Are the, oh, thank god. OK. Um, for those of you who don't use Spark, hopefully this is kind of useful, uh, even if maybe not as directly useful. Uh, it will at least give you some things to laugh at your colleagues about who use Spark. So that's good. So I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. It's uh, tattooed on my wrist. Um, I hope I updated this slide. Uh, yes, I, I now work at Google. Um, they're very nice people. They pay me money to work on open source big data. Um, and I like money. Uh, <laughs> prior to Google, I had a very similar job at IBM, where I worked on open source big data, mostly Spark. Um, and I've worked at a bunch of other companies as well. Uh, I'm a co-author of a few books on Spark. Um, I will try and convince you to buy these books because coffee in San Francisco is very expensive, um, and the royalties help cover about half of my coffee consumption. Um, that's about it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, the slides from today's talk will probably go on SlideShare if I remember. Um, normally what happens is I forget about it for a month and then someone yells at me. Uh, like normally the conference organizer yells at me and then I remember to put, put the slides on SlideShare. Um, so in addition to, to sort of who I am at work, uh, out of sight of work, I'm, I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm Canadian, I'm on a work visa in America. Uh, one of the ones they are currently debating whether or not they want to keep, uh, which is just a really fun experience, which I'm sure uh, no one in Britain has similar experiences with right now whatsoever. Um, and I also consider myself a part of the leather community. Um, and this is just as like an explicit reminder that we all come from slightly different places. Um, and if we all work together, right, we can build this shit faster, uh, or at least maybe even better if we're lucky. Um, and, and if not better, at, at, at least faster. Um, and yeah, you should be nice to your coworkers regardless of where they're from. Uh, my co-presenter, her name is Boo. Um, she travels with me very frequently. You can tell my hair dye is starting to rub off on her. Um, she is an author of a few books as well, uh, namely Learning How to Bark and High Performance Barking. Uh, she's not so focused on open source right now, but I'm working on convincing her to get a GitHub profile. In the meantime, you can follow her on Twitter. Um, so very serious. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why we should test and validate our programs. Um, hopefully, this is not the most difficult cell in the world. Uh, sometimes I find, though, that people use notebook environments for big data. And then because it's really hard to test, uh, they use this as an excuse not to. Um, and we'll talk about the excuses not to test as well. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of the specific considerations for testing Spark streaming. How many people have streaming data sources at their company? OK, many people. I'm assuming many people are also asleep. So that's, that's a pretty good representation of the people who are awake. Um, so I'm hoping you're all nice people. Um, you probably know Scala, so let's skip this slide. Uh, so why should we test? It makes us better people. Um, this is pretty important. Um, it avoids making your users angry. Uh, I don't like it when people call me. Uh, unfortunately, it's slightly too easy to find my phone number on the internet. Um, it helps you save money. This is, this is important. Um, you know, testing in production like Netflix does is great. Uh, the only slight problem is this can cost us a lot of money, especially for big data jobs, which can take a long time to run. Uh, if we just wait until they fail in production, uh, we may have used a thousand node cluster for eight hours. And uh, even with, I'm sure, uh, my employer's very reasonable discounts on sustained instance usage, uh, that can get kind of expensive. Um, admittedly, it helps pay my salary. So if you want to burn thousands of compute hours to test your jobs, you're more than welcome to. Um, and yeah, it, it also makes for a longer development cycle when we don't have good tests. Uh, and I think that one's really most important. Um, and a lot of us probably come from a background of having done QA work. It's pretty common to do that as an internship. Uh, and so maybe just remember your past self uh, being upset with the developers they worked with. Um, and yeah, really the thing is we don't want to go aboard the fail boat. The fail boat is a sad boat. It's a boat where we have to update our resume. Um, and 
you know, with jobs being continuously deploy deployed into production, uh, we no longer know when we need to update our resume. It could happen a week later when one of our data sources changes. Uh, it's not necessarily just when we wrote some new code. Um, and this is, this is similar to why we should validate. Um, it makes us better people. But really, fundamentally, we want to know when things have gone wrong. Um, eventually, we will all get aboard the SS failboat or HMS failboat, depending on your country of origin. Um, and, you know, we're auto-deploying a lot of our results into production. Uh, new machine learning models, we often don't spend a lot of time manually validating anymore. Um, I've certainly, uh, at one point in my career, pushed out a recommendation model, uh, which uh, I got some phone calls shortly later on that evening. Uh, and we rolled back that recommendation model. Um, and I'm sure that we all have the experience of something going to production and then freaking out and having to bring it back. Um, and this, this works fine for code that we're explicitly deploying, but for results of jobs, um, we might not necessarily even know that we've made the change, and other people in our organization might not know that we're the people to blame and call us. You know, our service is just going to degrade and things are going to be sad. So we need better monitoring of our big data jobs. Um, and yeah, I mean, avoid being woken up at 3 a.m. Is, is a good reason to validate your jobs, um, right? If, if we push it to production, we have to fix it right away. But if our software stops uh, from being pushed to production until we come into the morning to look at it and go like, oh yeah, this is actually okay, uh, or like, oh God, no, let's not push this into production, we can make those decisions during normal business hours. Um, and yeah, so we can see a lot of people uh, deploy their stuff automatically into production um, from Spark. Uh, it's a little under 40%. Um, this combined with the next slide gives us a pretty good reason. Around just over half of the people have not had a serious outage from their Spark jobs, and slightly under half of people have had a serious outage from their Spark jobs, right? And so that's, I mean, those are better odds than, you know, um, well, I've bet on worse odds than these, right? But you probably don't want to be betting your job on odds like these. Um, it's, it's not worth it, right? So avoid these outages, uh, and it's, it's not that hard. Um, so why don't we test if, if we all know we should test? I think a big one is that it's hard. It's a lot of work. Um, the other one is we believe our software is a special magical unicorn, which is somehow distinct from every other piece of software in the world. And while good engineering practices may apply to our coworkers, we are clearly just not going to write any mistakes. Um, and even if this is true for yourself, perhaps you should think about the people who come after you who will have to maintain your special magical unicorn um, and may realize that your unicorn is actually a horse with a, a horn duct taped onto it. Um, and they may be somewhat upset with you. Uh, and when it comes time to write their peer review of you, this could negatively impact your ability to uh, weasel more money out of your employer. Um, right, okay, so why don't we validate? It's uh, similar to why we don't test, um, but I think uh, a large part of it is actually for the people who do test their code, um, they think, I've got a pretty good test suite. I don't need to like validate that my job is continuing to run okay. I ran it like three times. It's going to keep running perfectly forever, or as I like to call it, engineering induction. Um, and it turns out that just proving three base cases is not the same as having a base case in N and an N plus one. Unfortunately, uh, we, we cannot simply extrapolate from three cases. Although I can draw you a very nice line if you want, um, and you're trying to raise money in San Francisco. Um, but that's special venture capitalist logic that we should not attempt to apply to our own software. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's worth testing your software, uh, specifically your Spark jobs. Um, and we're going to look at one of the simplest tests that we can do in Spark. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, this looks very much like a normal sort of test uh, that you would write in any Scala code. Um, it's a little uglier because you have uh, this like paralyzing of your input and collecting the results back. But at the end of the day, we can just assert that our things are going to look reasonable. Um, there's some boilerplate that uh, libraries can take care of. Or if you really enjoy writing boilerplate, uh, you can write your own code to set up and tear down your Spark clusters for you. Um, the only problem is that you probably are using Spark because you have more than five elements worth of data. 
Um, and occasionally, sometimes problems only show up when we actually have big data, right? Like, I can have things that work fine for five elements, but kind of fail at like 200,000. Um, and this, this sort of is problematic. Uh, so if we, if we have to come up with 200,000 inputs and what their expected resulting outputs are gonna be, that's gonna take a lot of time. Um, and also, this, this testing technique is no longer going to work, because we're going to collect it back, and then we're going to run out of memory. Everyone's favorite Java out of memory exception. Um, and so fundamentally, we, we can't just use Paralyze and Collect to really test Spark. Um, I, I'm not saying you should never use Paralyze and Collect, but this should only be one of the things in your toolkit. Uh, we should go beyond this. Um, and so we can validate our results with Spark's distributed set operations. Um, they aren't exactly set operations because Spark's distributed collections are not exactly sets. Um, they look similar enough, though. Uh, the only problem is it essentially says coffee, coffee, panda is the same thing as coffee, panda. And if you're going to take one of my coffees away from me, I'm going to cut you with a knife. Um, I like coffee. And Coffee Coffee Panda is distinct from Coffee Panda. Um, on the other hand, it turns out we can, we can actually we can just get Spark to do a shuffle, and then we can compare this pretty basically. Um, but essentially, instead of actually using the set operations, you want to use something which keeps in mind that your collections are not actually sets. Um, and this allows us to, to assert a quality or assert what our results are going to be. But this still requires coming up with a large test set and a large golden set as well. So where do we get our test data from? Um, a lot of people generate their test data by hand, um, and that, that works to an extent. Um, personally, I don't have the patience to write 200,000 sample input data, um, nor do I have the interns anymore. Uh, they went back to school. Um, they also suggested that next time I give the interns something more productive to do. Um, the other option is we can sample production data. Uh, this one actually works pretty well. The only problem is if you have this thing called uh, PIII, um, and we're in Europe, so you probably actually care about privacy. Uh, not that we don't care about it in America, it's just you have regulatory agencies who also care about it, and will find you, um, and then fine you. And those things tend to be a little more motivating uh, than the you know little poster on the wall that says respect customer privacy. Um, but regardless, Sampling production data is, is great and it's wonderful, but it can't be applied in all cases. Um, another thing which some people do is they just test on their entire production data, uh, which is what I take it to mean is they just test in production. Um, but if, if you can just do a full database dump and maybe you've got two different versions of your pipeline that you want to compare side by side, this is you know, a pretty reasonable thing to do, um, especially if you're like just doing performance tuning. Or, or things like this. Um, so the other option besides this is to use a property-based testing system. Um, and they're fun, yay, shiny things. And in my mind, we stole them from Haskell. Um, I don't know if this is actually the lineage. Uh, but Scala check is pretty awesome. And we can integrate it with Spark to actually generate huge distributed collections for us. Um, this has the benefit that it has no customer data in it unless you do really weird things. Um, and there's two different libraries for sort of integrating Scala check with Spark so that you don't have to put in the work to like make all of the things serializable correctly and, and distribute them. Um, and this is nice because then we can test you know, some really simple properties like this. Um, now, admittedly, this is you know, a pretty simple property. Uh, we're just saying that the number of elements should be the same afterwards. Uh, but we can actually catch a bunch of really interesting bugs this way. Um, and this is because our property checkers are able to be a lot more evil than I am. Um, and so while this just looks really simple, uh, and we've just asked it to generate strings, we haven't told it anything specific. Um, the, the RDD generators and data frame generators that people have written for Spark are actually very good at generating pathological RDDs and data frames, where you have things like empty partitions or large amounts of skew, all of which we have in real world. But when I'm making my sample input data, I somehow always forget to make an empty partition just to fuck with myself. Um, and so this thing is evil for me. And so that's convenient, because I don't have the time to be evil all the time, um, despite my previous job as an evil death ray. 
uh, which was quite enjoyable. Um, and we can also go ahead and test with one million entries. Was Dr. Evil not as popular over here? Um, OK, well, at least there's some people who remember Dr. Evil. So one million entries. Um, but really what this comes down to is we can just tell Scala check, like, yeah, what's up? I'm on a distributed system. I want to test with a lot of this shit. Just go do it for me. Um, and this is nice because it'll generate it on the different nodes in your cluster. You don't have to worry about like overwhelming one of them and having it die. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, but this can get a bit slow. It turns out testing one million entries um, in local mode is, well, you, you have one million entries in local mode. And then your computer just, you know, if you're lucky, it succeeds. Uh, and if you're unlucky, you get an out of memory exception. Uh, but that's, that's OK. Um, and so then we can test it on a cluster. Um, and that's pretty easy. All we do is we swap out local for the name of some cluster that we're going to use to do our tests. But even then, uh, now we're testing with one million entries, and, and that takes a while, uh, even on a cluster. And it turns out that while this is really important for catching some class of problems, a lot of problems we do are still really sort of classical simple problems, right? Like null pointer exceptions or forgetting to check if our strings are empty. Um, and so if you, you know, have problems where it's not related to the distribution of your data, uh, you can catch those with a lot simpler tests. Um, and so we can go ahead, um, and, I, and I don't mean to tell you never to write a Lambda expression, right? Like, I'm, I'm a functional programming person. I like my anonymous functions as much as anyone else. But occasionally, it makes sense to factor them out so that we can test them independently from the Spark code, and those tests can run a lot faster. And we can catch like a lot of bugs this way. As a general rule, I like to do this refactoring whenever I find myself having to debug the code around it. Um, that's normally a sign that this was more complicated than I thought, and it actually belongs in its own function, and we should actually write some explicit tests for this. Um, but that's, that's you know, pretty, I hope, non-controversial. Um, and so now let's look at testing Spark streaming. I don't see Yasek in the room, so this is convenient, because otherwise he would probably yell at me. Um, so Spark streaming is pretty much the same thing, except everything is on fire, and the lava is coming down the mountain towards us. Uh, we are the villagers at the bottom, and our streaming jobs have to finish before it gets to us. Uh, but that's all right. It's not too much work. Uh, we'll just set up a streaming context and figure out when our test is finished. And the problem is, uh, just doing that involves many slides worth of boilerplate code. Um, this is not intended to be read. This is intended to convince you not to write this code. It's not hard, but if you get any of it wrong, your tests will fail intermittently for unpredictable reasons. Um, and those are just lovely to debug. And now we have the clock. Um, so fundamentally, that's just to convince you that testing Spark streaming is unnecessarily complicated, and you should not do it by hand. Um, yeah, uh, creating the test data is hard. Um, there used to be an easy way to do it. We decided it was too easy for people to use, so we took it out of Spark. Um, or more specifically, we changed how it works but left the API in. Um, <clears throat> A classic. Um, collecting the data back locally to validate is hard in streaming, uh, so it's, it's difficult to actually assert a quality about this. Um, it's actually not that hard, it's just ugly. It involves using VARs, and VARs make me sad. And figuring out when our test is done is really the hardest part in Spark Streaming. Um, and this is because Spark Streaming has a really crappy understanding of time. Um, and fundamentally, uh, even inside of Spark, there are places where streaming test cases have sleep 300 and then check the results. And that just makes me sad, um, right? And I've, I've, I've seen a lot of shit on the internet, and, and sleep 300 still makes me sad. Um, but it's OK. We can abstract all of this nastiness away into one of our magical libraries. Um, there are several libraries. They all roughly take the same pile of poop and put the same carpet over top of it, but they've selected different fabric scents to use to cover up the smell. Um, and then we can fundamentally write the same test case that we did at the start, except now um, this is a list of lists, and each list represents a batch of data, and we assert the same results. Um, this works. Um, 
it's not particularly scalable, but it, it lets us test the way we know how. But if, if you listened to Yasek's talk yesterday, Spark Streaming is dead, according to him. I have some views about this, which we might not be on the same page. Uh, but data frames and data sets are certainly the new shiny thing in Spark. Um, and as anyone who occasionally has to update their resume when things go terribly wrong, it's important to be up to date on the new shiny things for finding new jobs. Um, also, sometimes they lead to better results. Um, so data frames, we can test them in fundamentally the same way, uh, because at the end of the day, data frames are simply a really, really nice wrapper around uh, the terribleness that we've hidden below. Um, and what we can do is we can just take a data frame and we can ask it to tell us its secrets, and it will because it's very nice, and then we can just compare its internals. Uh, alternatively, we can uh, do what they do inside of Spark um, and provide some simple functions to compare the results. Uh, and fundamentally, data sets just have types. I mean, by just have types, I mean they have types, and that's amazing, but really, we shouldn't have taken those types out to start with. Um, this looks pretty much the same, uh, except we have some nastiness because of the way how Spark handles implicit, so we're just going to move on from that. And we're going to focus on happy generators, because generators are cool. Um, so essentially, we can go back to, to the approach that we did before, but because data sets have this nice, understandable schema, uh, we can actually just take that schema and get Spark to make a generator for us, uh, and then we can write the same types of property-based tests we had before. Uh, once again, uh, definitely asserting very important things, like I don't actually know what this property is for. Uh, I assert this is an instance, okay, I assert it's an instance of a string. But you could put something actually useful in here, right? You can assert that, you know, all of the customer records that you get back are actually, you know, customer records, or the number of customer records you get back has not decreased since you applied some transformations to it. Um, and nicely enough, this stuff works on big data. Yay! But we could take data frames and data sets and combine them with streaming. Um, and so essentially combining two new APIs together can give us a third new API called structured streaming. Um, and if anyone knows anything about buying McDonald's hamburgers, um, two new things is better than one, uh, which is why they often come together in a value meal. OK, the McDonald's references work better in America. Um, but the, the TLDR is. I've got two new pieces of software that are poorly tested. I'm going to combine them together and build my business on top of it. What could go wrong? Um, and yeah, it turns out a few things. Um, but so it, it turns out that one of the things that has actually gotten a lot better in Spark Structured Streaming is uh, they realized that people need to test their code. Um, and they actually made it a lot easier. Uh, so you no longer have those pages and pages of setup code. If you run or write a structured streaming test by hand, uh, you can. this is pretty much almost all of the setup you have to do. There's the imports, um, but there's these built-in memory input and output streams, and you don't have to do crazy things to make them actually work. Um, that being said, you can still use a library. Oh, yeah, OK, here's part two where we actually assert the results. Um, admittedly, we lose some type information because software is hard, but fundamentally, this is not terrible. Uh, we can make a test for Spark Structured Streaming and not gouge our eyeballs out with a rusty spoon. Um, we can also use a library to test our fancy business logic, and then we don't have to write that boilerplate code, but it's not the kind of stuff where like, if we fuck it up a tiny bit, everything goes to hell. Um, it's pretty basic. So either way is, is fine. Um, and, and testing structured streaming is, is actually one of the bright points of it. Um, but I just want to reiterate that structured streaming is really new. And as excited as folks may be about structured streaming, uh, it's new. And new software is not inherently bad software, but it's software that we don't know how it's bad yet. Um, so it's really important if you're going to use structured streaming in anything resembling production or really anything where that could impact my life in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, so if you work in, for example, medicine or banking, which is somehow involved in my money, um, please, for the love of God, test your code thoroughly. Um, and also, don't make assumptions that things in Spark just work, especially for structured streaming. There's a good chance that something underneath the hood is going to do at least something unexpected. Um, 
and uh, yeah, let's move on because this is recorded and I shouldn't say too many bad things. Um, so here are some cats. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's, it's a palate cleanser before we move from testing to validation. Um, listen, it made sense when I was making this talk. Um, admittedly, I'm not sure how many cups of coffee were involved in this. Um, but OK, so validation is important too. Um, and fundamentally, this is because even if I use tools to help me be evil with my software, um, the real world is always more devious than I manage to be even when that was my full-time job. Uh, software is just, you know, really complicated. And it turns out when we start working with data, we tend to start working with other people. And other people are delightful. They do things for me for free. Um, sometimes they do things for me for money. But occasionally, they don't do what I expect. Um, and the problem is sometimes they do these things in ways I haven't predicted. And this happens a lot with data. Um, sometimes the meaning of a field will change, uh, or they'll just start filling in null because their system was broken that day, and they decided to put null there. Um, or instead of null, it'll be a string with the word null inside of it, because that makes sense. Um, or you know, the user's friend list will switch from being comma separated to tabs. Sure, why not? Um, and, and these people aren't being malicious, right? They're, they're just trying to get their job done. And they might not remember to come and talk to everyone who's using their data. They might not even know that they're, you're using their data. Um, and these, these little tiny inadvertent changes that people are going to do could just break everything, um, especially when people change the meaning of magic numbers, um, which you know I'm sure never happened. Oh, no, the slides went away. It doesn't like me anymore. OK. Well, um, oh, no. Oh, oh god damn Lenovo. OK. Well, it's convenient that I do not currently work for IBM, um, <laughs> because my laptop just crashed. And although it is a Lenovo, which is technically no longer IBM, uh, but so a slight uh, brief interlude. Um, think back to the cat pictures that we had earlier. Uh, and eh, fuck it. OK. Um, yeah, it's crashed hard. OK. So I have a white chalkboard. OK. Uh, I'm not actually going to use chalk, but I'm just going to stand here and hold a piece of chalk and pretend that I'm a professor. Um, because, oh, although I need boo. Yes. Um, so, why is validation important? Right. So at the end of the day, the real world is more fucked up than anything I can possibly imagine. Um, and hopefully anything than you can possibly imagine, unless you've had a really weird life involving data sets, um, in which case, good luck. Um, and so at the end of the day, we, we need to know when things on are, are on fire. Actually, I'm going to use the whiteboard and feel even more professory. No, when on fire. Hmm, that was supposed to look like flames. OK. But we want to know when things are on fire. And eventually, this is going to happen to us. Um, and it's going to happen in ways that we didn't catch in our test code. So how are we going to catch this? Um, so Spark conveniently keeps track of a lot of internal metrics. And it exposes these metrics to us uh, in a really terrible API. Um, we can register a callback receiver to collect these metrics, and then at the end of our job, we can look at all of the calls that we received and piece them together. Um, and this API is almost exactly not what you want, um, but it's convenient because I don't have to pretend to be inside of package org Apache Spark, and they've asked me to stop doing that. Um, and by they, I mean the people down the street from me, uh, which is inconvenient since they know where I work. So I have to listen to them, or at least pretend to. Um, so uh, what we can do is we can, we can just make this interface to the callback server, collect all of Spark's metrics, and then at the end of our job, before we actually push our new model into production, we can check to see if they look anything like the last time our job was run. Um, unless we are a failing startup, 
uh, or a failing not so startup, we might expect the number of records that we're reading in to be monotonically increasing. Uh, we might expect the number of users we have to be, you know, increasing. Uh, we might expect it to not be doubling. Doubling could be a bad sign. It could be a sign that something weird has happened. And so we can write a lot of sort of relative rules about how we expect the number of records we see today to be related to yesterday. Um, and it's a little painful to do, but I think it's pretty important. Um, in addition to the metrics that Spark itself keeps track of, if you're going to build something like a recommendation system where you pre-compute the recommendations for users, like you run ALS and then you, you generate a recommendations table, uh, you can do things like uh, explicitly track the number of users where you don't generate a recommendation for. And Spark itself doesn't have a metric for like that that's inside of your code itself, but Spark has a mechanism called accumulators. Um, does anyone use Spark accumulators? One person. What do you use them for? Person in plaid in the back. Okay. Oh, yeah, that would not work. Okay, right. So that is. A good example. Spark accumulators may sound like a thing that are generally useful, but in practice are not. Um, they're really good at adding numbers together, and pretty much anything beyond that, you are just in a world of sadness. Um, and adding numbers together in a way where you don't really care too much about the result, um, which is counterintuitive. But essentially, accumulators let us get out of this like purely functional restriction, uh, which I know we all love. We love purely functional programming because uh, we're at a Scala conference. But occasionally, we want some side effect information. And I don't want to have to rewrite my code to keep track of the number of users that we didn't generate a recommendation for. And so we can put an accumulator inside of this. And whenever it happens, uh, we just add one to the accumulator. And then when our job is finished, we can look at what the different values for the accumulators were. Now, these accumulators might slightly under or over count um, the number of times the event has happened, depending on what happens with our cluster in very unpredictable ways. Um, if anyone's really curious, I have a chapter in a book that you can buy um, called High Performance Spark, uh, which goes into this in detail. But fundamentally, um, don't pay people money or you know, charge people money based on the values of your accumulators. But they're a pretty reasonable thing to use for validation because you can say, hey, has the number of users that I didn't generate a recommendation for today increased substantially over yesterday? Um, and then if it like spikes 100x or if it decreases like 99x, maybe this is a thing that should be investigated and you don't want to push your new model to production just yet. Um, the other really good use case of this is when you're processing JSON data, um, not to accumulate the results of your JSON data, but mm, at least in my experience, most people who process JSON data have to deal with the fact that the world is made full of people who really didn't bother reading the JSON spec, myself included. Um, and some of your records are just going to be fundamentally invalid, and you're going to want to throw those away. And that's OK, right? If we stopped our job every time we encountered an invalid record, we would never really have a successful job. But if I throw away 99% of my data, uh, the model that I generate at the end of the day is probably going to be crap. Um, so I want to know how much of my data I've thrown away. And I want to be able to take some action based on this. So I can use accumulators to keep track of the number of records which I've accepted and the number of records which I rejected because I didn't understand what the hell was going on. Um, and then at the end of my job, I can assert that this is similar to yesterday or below some threshold or some other type of metric. Um, and that's pretty much all I remember about what I was going to talk about validation. Um, but if you're interested in validation, I do have a library. It's uh, unlike the other libraries I talk about, not one you should actually use. Um, it's an interesting proof of concept. It's called Spark-Validator. Uh, please don't use it in production. I'm pretty sure it won't compile against the latest version of Spark. I've been busy, uh, but that's OK. Um, the most important part is I have this new book. Um, and I receive enough royalties from the sale of this book to buy about one coffee in Ljubljana or a quarter of a cup of coffee in San Francisco. Um, 
And if your employer gives you a corporate Amex or corporate charge card of some type, it is the gift of the season. The holidays are coming up. Um, cats love it. Uh, mostly they love the box it comes in, but just don't return the book afterwards. I assure you the cat gets upset. Um, so if you have a corporate charge card, please buy several copies of my book. And that's, that's pretty much the note I'm going to end on. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, right, the book is called High Performance Spark. How could I forget that? Um, <clears throat> available from fine retailers everywhere. And not so fine retailers. Mm. <laughs> Actually, I do know a guy. Um, <laughs> if you want to buy the book, but like you've got cash, um, and you're in San Francisco, like, send me an email and we'll make it happen. Um, uh, I hope this is being recorded. Uh, just, uh, in terms of the validation of the data, if, because when we start to generate what we send and what we expect, we more or less controlling what the algorithm is actually performing at like it should. But if we just randomly generate some records, uh, is there any suggestion how to make sure what actually what is output is a physical output? Okay. Because it's generating something, it didn't crash, okay, it works. That's, yeah, so this is a good point. Um, so, so Scalacheck can take inputs for what kind of data you want it to generate and what the distribution should look like. Um, Spark also has a random RDD <coughs> generator built in that generates a different type, many different types of distributions of data. Um, and if you're curious, I, I think it's actually a really good practice that we should do in general, is for the different data sets that you're working on, um, Spark has a bunch of different built-in summary statistics, and it's really useful to actually run that. Um, figuring out what your distribution looks like, if it's like a, a long tail, or if it's a really skewed distribution, which I think a lot of our data sets are, um, oftentimes, we don't believe they're as skewed as they are. Uh, we, we think we have nice little normally distributed data, but it turns out all of the computers live in this place called Null, um, and all of the humans live in this city called New York. Uh, and these two places both really kind of fuck up all my jobs. Um, and so if you, if you run these summary statistics, it'll show you these things, and then you can actually have Scala check generate data, which looks like those kinds of distributions that you're experiencing, uh, and get a better idea of how your stuff is going to fail in real life. Do we have any more questions? Cool. Thank you.